Guess what? We haven't heard it yet. But when that trumpet sounds, we're going. Amen? Amen. The dead in Christ shall rise incorruptible. And we will be changed. But in the meantime, folks, we are to occupy till the Lord returns. That means we don't give up on anything. We keep our focus on all that Jesus wants to do. I'm going to read these. This is not original with me. I stole this from someone who knows a lot of stuff. (laughs) But there are seven eschatological core values, and I should get an A just for saying that long word, eschatological. These values is that I will not embrace an end-time worldview that empowers a disempowered devil. Colossians 2.15 says, Satan is disarmed and defeated. That means he has no arms and no feet. (laughs) That was just added. That wasn't in the Bible. (laughs) I will not accept an eschatology that takes away my children's future and creates a mindset that undermines the mentality of leaving a legacy. We are not to leave this earth till Jesus takes us out. Too many times we're ready to have the trumpet sound, and I think we're all ready for that. But Jesus said, that's in my time frame. You do what you're supposed to do. Occupy till I come. I will not accept the next eschatology. It takes away my children's future and creates a mindset that undermines the mentality of leaving a legacy. That's the one I just read. I will not accept an eschatology, theology, or theology that sabotages the clear command of Jesus to make disciples of all nations. And the Lord's prayer was that it can be on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught that prayer, by the way. If you have a problem with that, you have to talk to him. I will not tolerate or allow any interpretation of scripture that destroys hope for a nation and undermines the hope that ruined cities can be restored. Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 61 declares that. Until Jesus comes, we're to occupy expecting God to do great things. Certainly, we understand that days will be worse and worse. There will be a falling away. By the way, the falling away is among people who are half-hearted in their commitment. Or maybe not even uh, attempting to be strong in the spirit. And so they end up losing their hope for the future. I will not embrace an eschatology that changes the nature of a good God. I refuse to embrace any theology that celebrates bad news as a sign of the end times and a necessary requirement for the Lord's return. You understand that Jesus is coming back for a victorious church. Not a church standing on a mountain with fission burned clothes saying, get us out of here. But a church that though it goes through persecution and trial will be a victorious church when Jesus returns. I'm opposed to any doctrine that pushes the promises of God into a time zone that cannot be obtained in my generation and therefore takes away any responsibility that I have to believe God for them in my lifetime. To believe God for something of the promises to be fulfilled in my lifetime. Can you say amen? I know that's a mouthful. But listen, we serve a victorious Christ. And he's raising up a church that's a victorious church. And though there will be times that we go through difficulties, we have to understand that Jesus is still building his church and it still will be a mighty church even in the darkest times for he is building it. That he said that the very gates and councils of hell will not be able to stop the forward motion of the church of Jesus Christ. So I want to talk about something this morning that has to do with uh, a positive outlook on where we are in our history. Because last week was a little heavier than I wanted wanted it to be because uh, it can sound very... uh, Well, with all the stuff going on, we can start looking at newspaper articles or listen to the the TV news and all those kind of things and and basically come away with a... Uh, thought process that's that's in fear rather than in hope and in faith of what God can do. How do we influence a broken and sinful world? Didn't Jesus say that we were going to be an influence till the day he comes back? That we're not going to leave this world in any less power than we were birthed in. 
We were birthed in the power of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. With the power of the Holy Spirit. And his power isn't going to be diminished because of the things around us. In fact, it will be increased, the power of his spirit within his body, his believers. Nate Edwardson made this comment. The political spirit seeks to win, but not to serve. While the religious spirit seeks to be right and not to love. And right now there's a real division where on one hand... <clears throat> We see the battles in, this, in the realm of the politics. And by the way, that's a losing battle. That's a losing battle. But we're not in a political spirit. We're in a kingdom spirit. And the religious spirit is one Jesus had to contend with all the time. A spirit that seeks to be right. And then because we're right, we don't love. That we look down our nose on a culture that desperately needs the good news of the gospel. Jesus' response to his disciples who were quarreling over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. He said this in Matthew 23, verses 11, 12. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. In Mark 10, Jesus said this. When they, again, this harkens back to his disciples who are quarreling about who's going to be the greatest. Who's going to be the greatest? You can almost see them lining up and saying, since we're so close to Jesus, you know, who's going to be the captain of the team? And Jesus brings this caution. He says, those that are considered rulers over the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever desires to be a leader among you must be your servant, Jesus taught. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. Now everybody goes, that's a bad translation. (laughs) Must be a servant, a slave of everyone else because how did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save. That was lost. He he, He came to serve. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we're facing some really heavy duty things these days and it's very very easy to trip over the stuff that's in the newspaper and the television and end up getting ourselves either in a religious spirit or a political spirit that polarizes the church and gets us away from our mission and the thing that God called us to. We're to affect a change in this world Because Jesus' power is not going to be diminished because evil powers will become worse and worse. The Bible says in the last days. It will be demonically fierce times. And it will seem as though the church is being overrun. In fact, Daniel says in the book of Daniel chapter 7, it says it will seem as though the, 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 the Antichrist spirit will be Rising up with greater influence. And while we know, in fact, that that mystery of iniquity, that that Antichrist thing has been happening since Jesus talked about it. And we live in a fallen world, folks. And and this world isn't designed to last forever. It's going to one day end up burning up with a fervent heat and melt away. There'll be a new heaven and new earth. But in the meantime, we are called to occupy until Jesus comes. The disciples face some of the same dilemma that we face. And that is, as Jesus is getting ready to leave, they've just witnessed the resurrection power of Jesus. They've just seen, you know, for 40 days, Jesus has proved himself to be who he said he was. He's getting ready to ascend to the Father. And they said, now, Lord, will you restore the kingdom at this time? Again, restore the kingdom of Israel. Now, Jesus gave them an answer they probably didn't want to hear because they're looking for a political kingdom. 
It is not for you to know the times. This is Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus leaves us with this assignment. Don't be ready to check out till the Lord sounds the trumpet. Mark 10, verses 42 through 45. Jesus gathered them, and I'm going to say this again out of Scripture, gathered together his disciples, says, those, who recognize, those recognized as rulers of the people, this is from the Passion Translation, and those who are in the top leadership positions rule oppressively over their subjects. But this is not the example you're to follow. You are to lead by a different model. If you want to be the greatest, then live as one who's called to serve. And I wonder how many of us have wished that we could just rise up and just come in the fierceness of the Lord's wrath and fix everything that's broken. And fix some of those knuckleheads with the other people that we want to fix. But the Lord says this, the path of promotion comes by having a heart of a bond servant, one who serves everyone. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life as a ransom price for the salvation of many. Jesus declares, and he says it even at this time in our, in our existence, and that is, my kingdom is not of this realm. John 18, 36 the context is that Jesus is before Pilate and he asks Jesus, or he says to him, hey, listen, why is your own people, your own nation, why have the priests who you should be, they should be on your side, why are they bringing you to trial? What have you done? And Jesus answered, said, listen, my kingdom is not of this realm the world realm. The royal power of my kingdom realm does not come from this world. If it, de- if it did, then my followers would be fighting to the end to defend me from the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom authority is not from this realm. It's not from the political or the religious realm. By the way, that's not to say that we're not to have influence in those realms, but not on the basis of how the world gains its influence. Are you following me so far? That's really weak. Because I'll go back over the whole thing all over. So you better. (laughs) I knew it would always get that. All right. Jesus declares the nature of his kingdom. When he taught us to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. For my kingdom is not about what you eat or drink, but living a life of righteousness That is goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. My kingdom is not just a lot of talk, Jesus said. It is living by God's power, 1 Corinthians 4.20. The Passion Translation says, The kingdom realm of God God comes with power, not simply impressive words. The gospel of the kingdom comes with power. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And I want to just have you be reminded of this one thing. We, uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, we always want to thank God for you all and pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and Father about you. To think of your faithful work and your loving deeds and the enduring hope that you have because of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and he has chosen you to be be his own people. For when we brought you good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what he said was true and what we said was true. And you know our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. In other words, we demonstrated how important it was to live out this faith. 
We should be concerned for those around us. So you, you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. In spite of the severe sufferings it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. Skipping down verse 8, and this is out of uh, Thessalonians. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, to, we find people telling us about your faith. We don't, even, we don't need to tell them about it. For they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve in the living God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of the Son of God from heaven. Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of judgment. So, how does the kingdom influence a world? How are we supposed to influence this world right now? Do you think that we'll do it with political power and persuasion? Do you think it will because we put religious pressure? Or because the Bible says that we will be influential as the Holy Spirit pours out his glory and power in and through the church? We will influence this world by a faith that we demonstrate in how we live our lives. John 13 says we will know, they will know that we are disciples by our love. And a new commandment I give you that, you are, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we know that in this world, we have to have the overwhelming manifestation of God's love as we face a very hostile world. Right now, I feel that there are camps being developed where we, we have an us and them mentality. And it's clear, there's a clear division be, between light and darkness. There's a clear division between what is righteous and what is unrighteous. But we are not warriors in the sense of the typical way that politics and also false religions get their job done or get their way. Our influence is not a light that's shining in the face of people like an interrogation. Not as salt rubbed into open wounds, but by the leaven of the kingdom of God. Leaven is not always represented in scripture as being evil. Jesus talked about leaven of the kingdom, that though we have a small, what seems to be small and insignificant, (laughs) this kingdom leaven, when it gets into the dough, if you will, anybody that do anything with bread, I mean, making bread and all that stuff, you know, you put that uh, stuff in there, yeast, and it swells up. I always was fascinated by that. You know, Grandma would make a little thing of, dough and then you come by a couple hours later and the thing is boy that's more good donuts for me you know or whatever the kingdom of God is always expanding but it is needed into the culture you and I represent that leaven of God in a culture and we make the difference And what's happening, and often it is not so much what we see on the screens, what we see in the political environment. It's what people feel because of the influence that we have wherever we are. Because I know right now many people feel so powerless because of what's going on in our government, going on in our government. And the problem is, and it's dangerous because I know how easy it would be to slip into that political argument. And to start pointing out those people that we know are clearly in cahoots with the Antichrist. (laughs) Because Jesus warned about the leaven of Herod. What is the leaven leaven of Herod? It's it's just political. It's the political climate. And if you want to have a, a really dangerous life to live, go ahead and get into a political argument with someone. You will lose. 
I don't care how righteous your position will be. You will lose. Because the whole world, the Bible says, Jesus said, the whole world lies in the wicked one. This present world, the God of this world, controls much of what's going on in this world. However, at the same time, Jesus is still, is still the sovereign Lord over it all. Amen. So men can do what they want, but ultimately the final word comes from the one whose, word cre- whose words created the heavens and the earth. The politics. Jesus warned of these leavens. He said that the second leaven was the leaven of the Pharisees, which is a religious leaven. It's it's that religious thing that wants to creep in and not even truly represent God or Jesus. And we saw it in the Pharisees, Sadducees. The wouldn't seize and couldn't seize in Jesus' day. The high priest who ultimately judged him and put him on the cross. Even though, by the way, Jesus said, no man takes my life. I will lay it down. Even in their best efforts, they thought they were winning. But Jesus said, guess what? I hold the keys to this whole thing. Because when I die, I will rise again. Then there's what they call the leaven of the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about that in verse 18, that the leaven of the kingdom. And Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to see what's going on. I want you to hear what I've said and remember what I've taught you about the nature of the kingdom. For the kingdom of our God and his Christ will one day take over this evil world. But by the way, do we just sit around in the meantime and just hope we can manage through it? Or has God ordained for us that the strength of the Lord would arise out of Zion, that the people of God would have a powerful influence in our present world? And the problem is too many people are waiting for the trumpet to sound or hoping that somehow they'll get through it instead of saying, I know God has called me to be more than a conqueror through him who died for us and rose again. We are called to be more than conquerors. By the way, if you know anything about bread dough rising, I can remember this as a kid going to grandma's house that she'd make this stuff and then you'd go, man, that's gonna, that'll, that'll only be enough for me. <laughs> and then you come back a few minutes later and it's puffed up, you know. Because of the life-giving power of the yeast we see the measures of flour that is mixed begin to grow. I didn't know this, but 22 kilos of bread dough, and I don't know what kilos mean, except for that I know what this last part says. It's enough to feed to feed 300 people. The, the, the leaven of the kingdom of God will grow, but not grow the way that we'd like to see it grow. It grows from a different dimension. So I want to try to, to, to conclude this morning with what I want to share is because I want to look at the fact that there is a, there's an example in Scripture. Take your Bible, by the way, and turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And if you know anything about Daniel, he was a... Uh, an amazing person. Daniel was a man that knew the Lord. And there's some things about Daniel that I want to remember this morning, and that is actually several things. Number one, Daniel was a man of great character. Daniel was a man who knew God. Daniel was just in the same shoes that we are today. He was challenged by the captivity. We, You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> we are not actually as captive as Daniel was, but yet the influence of our present world represents that same kind of captivity that ultimately would desire to suppress and to reduce the church's influence to nothing. But Daniel, because he was a man of God, challenged the captivity. Daniel challenged it because he had convictions in his heart. He knew the God he served. And I always quote this scripture from Daniel eleven thirty two: 32. The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. 
The previous verse or the previous part of that verse says, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by the flatteries. But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So we see Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. They're taken captive. They have to take their conviction seriously, even if it means death. And they have all kinds of opportunity to compromise through the rationale of what has happened to them. They're no longer in their home country. They're now you know, in captivity in a foreign land with a foreign king. And something a lot of people don't recognize, and men and brethren, you can identify with how serious this matter is. I want to see how many of you are going to stay with me. Those Hebrew boys, when they came in, many of them, especially with Daniel and the three Hebrew boys that are known in Daniel, were all castrated. And if you think you had a <laughs> you're all so serious. If you think you had a tough day, imagine how they must have felt. Because they're made eunuchs to serve the king and to serve his kingdom. But even in the natural realm, when it would seem there would be no ability for them to have influence by creation or procreation, yet God shows that he is never bound by the things that this world would try to do to us. But people who have a conviction and who know the Lord, those that know the Lord shall be strong and do exploits. I want you to notice a couple of things in Daniel <clears throat> chapter 1. I'm going to begin at verse 3. Then the king instructed the master of the eunuchs to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace and to whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them so that they, at the end of that time they might serve before the king. By the way, the parallels of that right now, much of our present world is trying to recreate a generation that will serve the pagan rulers of our country rather than serving the Lord. And we have actually seen, folks, a whole generation, help me somebody, a whole generation that doesn't have any of the same information that you and I have. And we drop the ball at some point, but also the intensity of this present world system has caused there to be even more of a pushback on believing anything that has to do with God's design and purposes for mankind. Now among those were the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. By the way, those are the biblical names. To them, the chief of eunuchs gave them other names. They gave them Daniel the name Bel- Belshazzar, and to Hanani, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Every one of those name changes represented an identity with a foreign deity, deity and not the God of Israel. So they're taking away the God-redemptive names that they were given that somehow, by the way, when God gave a name to these people, that there was something in the power of that name, of God's identifying them with a certain level of influence and a certain level of divine protection and divine ability. And so they come in and they're Put through this situation to change their identity. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Now, the reason I'm, I'm going with this, Rod, right, I want you to listen. What's happening in our world right now, <clears throat> if you try to fight this battle in the flesh, you will lose. We wrestle not with flesh and blood. Help me, somebody. We wrestle spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities and power. If you try to do battle in the flesh, you will lose. We win when we are uh, operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
doesn't always look like what we hope it would look like or feel like it, like we're really winning. But in fact, the Bible says, listen, the kingdom of God is needed into the culture through his people so that what seemed to be insignificant one day, all of a sudden we see how yeast and the, the, the leaven begins to expand that culture. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and goodwill of the chief of eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. I fear him. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men around you that are the same age? then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat, yuck, and water to drink. There's no diet pop there. Boy, it's just sad. Some of you know that water is something that we drink before we had soda. Okay. Then let the appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. Hmm, that's good. Better and fatter. Better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who had ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion. <laughs> That's how you make enemies with a foreign people. They're picking out on the king's stuff. We're eating vegetables and junk, uh, stuff. And it makes such an influence on the keeper of the exiles that they take away all the goodies and give them other stuff. That would create a little bit of tension Maybe not for you, but it would for me. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all the literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all the visions and dreams. Now at the end of those days, those days of test, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them forth before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king interviewed them. And among them all, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in his realm. Thus, Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. Now, there's a lot more to be read there, but I want you to first of all see this, that... that <clears throat> God's raising up people in this hour of character. Now, it's true that Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they were physical specimens. They were good-looking kids. Good, good looking. They, they came into this thing as, as exiles. But they were physical f- specimens, and not only were that, but they, they maintained the kind of thing that would keep them in the top of their game. We have in this country, and I, I don't want to spend much time on this because it gets very convicting that... We have a lot of fat people in our country. But that doesn't, by the way, mean that you're inferior. So get that. You're not inferior. I know I'm not. But they were physical physical specimens. They were mentally superior, socially graceful and spiritually exceptional because they were able to take a stand, purposed in their heart. So where am I going with this? I'm I'm saying, folks, listen, with everything that's going around us, going on around us right now, our our authority, our power, our ability to make a difference is not going to be done the same way as the world gets it done. Ours is an internal work that God is doing. Ours is a thing where what God has put within us begins to manifest outwardly. And we may not have the platforms that everybody else does with what seemingly unlimited power, but we have this other thing of the Holy Spirit working in us so that those who are in charge of 
determining how we navigate will find, as it says in the case of Daniel, that the chief of eunuchs basically had great love and favor for Daniel because of what he saw in his life. You know, we ought to be, as Christians, a cut above anybody else when it comes to our place in the, work, in the workforce. Amen. They should see in us a quality of service and, and diligence and excellence that sets us apart from the rest of the world. And thus it was with Daniel and the three Hebrew boys. Because out of that excellence, they were given these abilities by the Spirit of God to, to interpret dreams and to know what God was doing in the spiritual realm. Yes, it's true. They were challenged by captivity. Just as today, we are challenged by the world in which we live. Anybody recognize that we're being challenged right now? We're going through a difficult time as a nation. And it all depends on what side of the political spectrum you are on, whether you think that things are going better or things are going worse. And the worst part of it is that if we get on a side where we want to just denigrate and smash up everything we don't like, we're not going to have much of an influence. And though it may be true what we're seeing fall apart around us, our role is not to point out Necessarily things that we cannot change, but to change those things that God has equipped us to change. And folks, that means living out our faith in such a way that people can see the hope that we have. You see, every day we are, there's an attempt in our present world to change our identity. Young people are constantly being bombarded with what you should look like, what you should believe, the kind of entertainment you have. And folks, I'll tell you what, the greatest compromise that's going on right now is how the enemy's getting into the head and then into the heart of people and they're not walking in the ways of the Lord. It's tragic. It's, it's sad. It's... When the world says you have to be this to be effective or you have to be this to be accepted, and we are so conscious of that right now that We'll do just about anything, at least this generation does, almost anything to be accepted and not to have to be in the, in the spotlight of persecution. But I promise you that if you live godly for Christ's sake, you will suffer persecution. You will not blend in. But it doesn't mean that you'll rub, the, rub salt in the eyes of those who disagree with you. It doesn't mean that you'll become an obnoxious, obnoxious religious nut but that you'll live out your faith in such a way that people will see the difference in the way you live, in the way you love, in the way that you face the things in our present world with the confidence that our God still reigns when it seems like all hell is taken over. And we see some bad stuff, but folks, it's nothing compared to what ultimately the enemy has for this planet. I mean, we, uh, there is some real persecution going on. We don't see much of it. It's not reported on uh, CNN or Fox. It's not reported there. But there's stuff going on where there's some persecution. And there's some things where, uh, that would shock you if you knew how much is going on behind the scenes that we never hear about. It. But we could either make ourselves victims or rise up with the strength of the Lord and say, I'm not going to be pushed aside because of the threat or because what apparently seems like we're the underdog and we're not winning. Jesus has designed a church that even the gates of hell will not prevail against us. They, listen, ultimately, God's kingdom wins. Amen. Amen. The world will attempt to change your identity. And by the way, the, the, the saddest thing right now is a whole generation of young people, their identity is being challenged as whether or not they're male or female or whatever other 50 identification there are now with reference to a person's sexual identity. And they, they think we're, 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 meant, or we're jaded. If you think about it, we should hold fast to who we are. 
but not in some prideful way and not somehow rubbing it in the eyes of those around us, but to live out our faith in such a way that the power of the Spirit of God will manifest in and through us. You see, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, they were raised in such a way in the Jewish culture that when they came into a foreign pagan culture, They were not overcome by it because they spent years being schooled, tooled for service under a pagan ruler. And we worry someday, you know, is our present school system going to turn our kids into atheists or agnostics? I'm going to tell you, you know where that falls, folks? Dear ones, listen to me. That falls on the hearts and lives of every person who's had children or grandchildren that you and I must have such conviction about what we believe that we instill into our children the kind of spiritual values, biblical values, that enables them to be put in the most harsh environment and they stand strong in the kingdom because they have convictions built on the the relationship with Jesus and the understanding of his word. And the problem is we dropped the ball some years back, dear folks. And we've traded away interaction with one another for interaction on a screen, a computer game, or whatever. And all of a sudden, subtly, the enemy encroaches in the same way that the leaven of the kingdom will expand for good. The leaven of the enemy will get into the hearts and minds of young people and frankly, people who are not grounded in the Lord until that leaven of evil begins to take place and suddenly a generation doesn't know the difference between good and bad. Oh, the church needs to wake up to the fact that those that have convictions will break the captivity that's around them. Let me say that again. Those who have convictions will break the captivity of those things around them. Well, you know, we're being changed by what's going on in our world. Hello, Mars. We are. We have that constant pressure to compromise or to be conformed to this world. And that's why Paul said in Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's not three wills of God. That's one will of God. Good, acceptable and perfect. So now they're, they're facing this three-year thing. They're facing a new diet. A, not only a diet of what they eat, but a diet of what they're going to learn. And someone takes a step and says, it's just a little thing. But because Daniel and his boys decided, we are not going to give, our way, give way to those things which could lead us into a sloppy, even dietary practice. The world says you should do this. You should eat this way. And by the way, I'm not here in any way trying to give you dietary rules of what you should eat. A lot of people think I look like a burrito, and they would be right. Because I love love Mexican food. So I'm not saying (laughs) that was a good one. At least for me, I'll laugh while you stand and stare. But the bottom line is... (laughs) The world wants to press us into its image even by what we partake into our bodies. So it tried to take us captive in our identity, tried to take us captive in our belief system and how we live out our lives. And also, hey, by the way, this is what you should eat. You know what really makes me mad? Is they tell you you have to wash your clothes in cold water. My wife said, don't worry, honey. It doesn't mean that you have to be in them when we watch them. (laughs) Listen, convictions that stand will have influence. Because Daniel and those three boys, they had purposed in their heart. They avoided even the taste of the things that were permitted. Mom and dad are not looking over our shoulders. We're captives in a strange land. We can eat whatever we want. Babylon, you know. 
We can drink whatever we want. <laughs> whatever we want. You guys are way too serious. So we're hungry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A couple more hours and we'll get there. All right. But these guys had such conviction in their lives that they said, we're not going to, if we start off eating what the king has said we have to eat, we're going to be captives to our own appetites. And so they decided to avoid even the taste, avoid the dependence, the habits that end up being a hang up, and even avoided the desire for things that were not good. Now, I, I know that when you read it where it says they, they decided to have vegetables and pulse, whatever that is, the, the vegetables are bad. Now, they pulse. I just don't even want to know what that is. <laughs> but they, yeah, that's, no, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. That, that summed it up for me. <laughs> By the way, I do like beans. All right. So they decided that they would not compromise. They avoided the taste, the dependence, and the desire. Their rationale, rationale for compromise was on them every day. And folks, we're living at a time right now that even among Christians, there is a, a, a clear, um, let me back up, maybe not a clear distinction of what is really right It used to be a time that people lived together. They called that fornication if they weren't married. Nowadays, it's, it's no big deal. Even people who say they're believers say, well, that doesn't really matter. So they violate some of the basic laws of God for the spiritual, mental, and physical health of people because they say, well, it, you know, the popular thing right now is we don't have to succumb to those rules because, hey, after all, it's the 21st century. But God's word doesn't change. And God's word isn't there. Protect you from the damning, damaging thing that happens in life when you compromise the thing that God says will not work. For you. I'm not at home anymore. I'm not a kid anymore. My parents aren't over. They're not telling me what to do. I'm I'm growing up enough that I call my own shots. And by the way, I'm not really affected by peer pressure because right now all the peers that I'm related to are. We're kind of in agreement on what we decide we're going to do. In our desire to fit in to a world system, we suddenly find ourselves without the ability to resist what's not good and discern the difference between. And besides that at all, listen, it is the command of the king. You shall do what he says you should do. But somehow, now let's, let's put this into context and I'll get everybody's attention when I say this. Daniel, and we know this about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and that was their foreign names. That these guys, you know why they were in charge, the person in charge of them was the prince of eunuchs? And every man goes gulp. Because they were made eunuchs when they came into the kingdom of Babylon. Oh, I, I, guys, you didn't hear me. You should all be going, yikes. They suddenly were now made without sex drive. They, their testicles were removed. Now they weren't going to be a threat to procreate and they were not going to be a threat to the women of Babylon in the captivity. Now that right there no, alone would be enough for people to say, this really sucks. But you know what? Daniel and those guys didn't focus on the things that they had endured being taken captive, but decided instead that they would let their influence be known by how they served. Now, I hope you follow with me because <clears throat> in, in the way that I started this thing today was that we have to understand the world in which we live and the pressures that we have on us that are not just external pressures of a fallen world, but literally a demonic influence that would tell us you really must conform or you're not going to get very far in this world. But Daniel was willing to take a stand and risk his own life and his partners in this by saying to the chief of eunuchs, put us to a test. I wonder how many today would say, you know, I don't like what's going on. 
And I want to challenge, I want to challenge the system by saying, I'll see who has the courage and the stuff to stand up to a world that says, you will conform to what we want. And you know what, in in this present world, anyone who stands up against that system of the world is considered to be weak in their mind or somehow under some religious oppression that you can't do what we do. So, oh, you poor thing, you can't fornicate anytime you want. You can't do drugs, you can't do whatever. What a restrictive God. But listen, Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, at least those guys we know had a conviction about who they were and what God designed them for. And they were going to live that way, even in spite of the fact that, that a major part of their identity as men had been removed. So what do you, what do you trade off? And I'm not saying, by the way, this is not a sermon about if you really want to serve God, go see a doctor. Go have some radical surgery. Let me hear all the men say, no. no. That was so weak. No. Thank you. Anybody else want to join in? No, I don't want. Okay. I'm not getting that point across. <laughs> what time is it getting to be? Okay, good. Because Daniel had this character about him, even those that were in charge of how they were to live their life, suddenly saw something in Daniel and the three Hebrew boys that caused them, caused this chief of eunuchs to have tender love and favor. It was not a sexual thing. Tender love and favor for these guys that he saw brought in under captivity and seeing what they went through and identifying with these Jewish boys what they had gone through. And so here's Daniel saying, listen, as a believer in Almighty God, we can't do these things. Could you put us to the test? They could have easily said, we have no choice. But Daniel and the three Hebrew boys set a whole new standard of excellence. And he challenges the status quo. Verse 12 basically says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put it to the test and we'll see who's going to stand before. Now, here's the interesting thing, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here. They do have a day we're going to face. They're going to have a day we're going to face the king. It's not about just playing like you mean business, but the knowing that one day you will stand and based on how you perform and based on the excellence of what you have become, whether you would be in a king's palace guarding the king's valuable things, mainly his harem or other governmental things that they had to trust the people had wisdom, knowing that stakes were so high. I don't know that Daniel thought, you know, if we just do this right, they will end up being in the ruling class here. But that because Daniel's convictions were such as they were, that God saw in them and caused him to have favor. And the Bible says he excelled 10 times more than anyone else that was tested. I remember growing up as a teenager, I did teenager, I just thought, man, if I can just, if I get straight D's, I'll make it. <laughs> I don't even hear any pity out of any of them. But there came a point where you have to say, I'm gonna be an excellent, I'm be, I will be excellent because what's at stake here, my witness is one of the king's kids. I may be under a pagan king, but the one I'm really under is the God of all creation. And so they challenge the status quo and they excel above it all, verses 17 to 21, where the king says, man, these guys are 10 times smarter. They're more, they're, they're healthier. And, they, and here's the other thing. They know all about the... Chaldean religion and philosophies of that day. So they're uniquely equipped to blend in with what the culture demanded of them externally, but in their heart, they were unchanged when it came to how they serve the living God. This, dear ones, is how we have to live in this present world. And this is how young people, this is how youth, children, young adults must recognize something. We're called at this time to not conform to this world, not to buy into the patterns of of how this world operates. 
Whoever has the most authority at the top gets to rule. And you know what Jesus says? Whoever is humbled at the bottom, God will exalt. Yes. Yes, sir. We don't know sometimes in this generation what it means to be humble. But those that bow their knee to the Lord will never bow their knee to a pagan king. Because right. God will see them even through the lion's den and through the fire furnace. Will you stand with me this morning? There's a whole lot more I'd like to say, but time gets away quick. How many hear what the Lord's saying through his word today? By the way, I don't need your amen to keep going, but it would be nice to know every now and then that you're hearing what I'm saying. So can I get a a shout one way or the other? Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now I feel better. We'll get you out of here in the next few minutes. (laughs) Well, I can't. I, I've got a lot. I've got enough notes to keep going. But listen, I want us to just take this moment to say, Lord, the world around us is trying to press us into their mold. We're tempted to somehow think that our authority, our influence, will be gained by the same way that our present world gets its influence by lording it over. But instead, Lord, you said we serve. Just as Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served a pagan king, yet under that king, he had to confess that there was no God like Daniel's. No God like Abednego. And though he did not convert, he nevertheless regarded highly the fact that this God is like no other God because he is the God above all others. Lord, we are under a lot of pressures these days. But we declare that the God we serve is high and above all. Far above every principality and power. This God we serve in the name of his son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Today, Lord, we would decide that we will live under the aegis, under the blessing of the Lord God on high, no matter what the persecution is understanding our purpose, we will be who Jesus called us to be. Would you put your hands out and just say afresh with me this morning, God, we invite Holy Spirit to come and empower us with spiritual insight, wisdom, boldness, and courage, Lord. That we will live our lives in such a way that while we may not have the platform of power in our present world, we have a foundation that cannot be eroded by anything around us, and that that leaven of the kingdom of God, that leaven will begin to permeate everything around us as we live and move, and our very being is designed by God to have influence. And this we say, church, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Say it again, in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Well, may God bless you this morning. May you bless the word to your hearts as you go. God bless you. Have a great day. Celebrate the goodness of the Lord. Thanks for being here. Hug one another. Shake hands. Don't get mixed up. We'll talk to you later. God bless you.